I think it's an exciting time to be in, in specialty coffee, like for the last few years, but more and more so. Um, it's an absolutely exciting product. It's, uh, it's a new product for many. Suddenly we have taste in coffee. We have a sustainable uh, product. And um, uh, we have, and for many people, it's a new revelation. Um, we have a barista scene that's like super excitable, uh, very connected through sharing of knowledge, through sharing experiences and passion. And we have farmers that we can empower to do like sustainable work by paying a premium price and then passing that through to the end customer. Um, as I travel, I meet so many people and recently in, in Asia especially, um, you feel like a really humble uh, scene of uh, people that are like connecting uh, in, a, in a world where we are kind of like losing identity because it's all on the internet and we are looking for groups to connect to and uh, a, a purpose and a, and a task. And uh, many, of, many of those baristas are probably looking for the next stage uh, in their development in, and in their career. And I think um, uh, one of the important things we need to do in specialty coffee is sharing, but also like building a market and building awareness. And so I wish that uh, more people would open shops. And uh, so that's how the idea came up with Hannah uh, and the team to just take you through some like steps of, uh, uh, and it may be a little bit technical <laughs> here and there, but uh, really to, to process um, the thought of um, how to plan and how to build a uh, specialty cafe and what to look out for. Uh, I think in the workshops later on, we will actually plan and build a cafe together and spin some ideas. And by doing that, I hope we get a lot of questions and uh, hopefully not making everybody nervous, oh, there's so much to do, but probably also lowering the level of fear and really try to engage it. It's, it's a wonderful thing uh, to do, to have your own and to um, take ownership of it. So um, um, just quickly, um, what is your position on the, on the value chain? I think the, the train of thought, uh, do you want to be involved in sourcing uh, fantastic green beans uh, do you want to trade uh, coffee? Do you want to be a roaster? Um, do you want to be involved in selling the finished product online or offline? Or uh, do you want to operate your own cafe? Or do you just want to stay on the other side of the bar and drink beautiful coffee and continue your the job you have at the moment? So um, we've decided we want to open a, a, a cafe. Um, so. The motivation check, I think, is really, really important. Um, I think it's coming up to Christmas, and uh, we will see a lot of ads that dogs are not for Christmas. And uh, don't <laughs> put them out afterwards if you don't like it anymore. I think if you s invest in a cafe or in a coffee shop, um, it's kind of like a longer-term relationship. Um, so I think the motivation check is, um, is very good. Why do you want to do this? What are your expectations? Uh, from from that, how serious are you are? Um, what level of operational work do you want to put in? Do you just want to be like someone who owns a shop and you have fantastic people working in it, or do you want to be the person serving and you're the head barista or you're the shop manager? Um, so, what where would where would you be uh, on 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 that um, value value line? What are your talents? When I started um, with a barn, I, I, I wasn't a barista, um, but I, I knew a pretty good one. Uh, so I hired him and he was teaching me everything I needed to know on the coffee side. Um, and um, so I can, 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 can was able to put my vision uh, together into like the whole shop concept. Um, so required skill sets, a skill set, uh, barista and coffee knowledge, gastronomy, managerial, the marketing side, and brand building, and then finance, of course. And if you don't want to have a one-woman or one-man show, um, you probably need, at some stage, HR person. Um, and it's probably the area where um, we spend most of our time um, because we work with very talented and passionate people. And um, there's always a lot of... Um, uh, attention and training and so on going into that and making sure the team settings are right and and uh, all these things that are important um big question um 
what what should your concept um, look like? Um, do you want to do something that you saw and you want to do the same? Um, I picked some kind of like fairly similar um, designs um, that are that I liked a lot in uh, my recent trip to Asia, and then um, here is a guy in Beijing. Um, probably my best coffee experience I had. Uh, a really, really small shop, siphons, um, 12 coffees, small roast machine, really good greens, uh, very humble, quiet, um, obviously a language barrier, but I had a translation program. Um, and they all have Wi-Fi, so... <laughs> um, this, this was, for me, I will not forget this guy. And uh, he's really, really busy and very, um, very, very specialized but not very Instagrammable, maybe. So, um, but these shops are great too. So the question is like, what, um, what, what is your concept? What is so special about you? So define your DNA. What is your strength? Um, let's assume, you know, coffee is the key, but it could also be foods. Um, what do you want to be recognized for? Um, serving the best coffees, having geishas only, uh, have the best vibe or the nicest ambience and atmosphere in your shop, um, be, in a, be a hub in the neighborhood, uh, be really, really busy on a high street, uh, or be a little bit more sec secluded with a like tiny bar and do everything like made to order with a personal service, kind of like, um, uh, how do you call it in, um, in Melbourne? The taste lab or yeah like a like a taste lab experience um, what is your com community what is your concept so I think these are really really important questions to make your um, uh, uh, cafe successful and to give it authenticity I think people can smell when they walk in if something is um, is real or not real I think um, content is really important to me um, obviously, like many, many concepts could work, but um, assuming we are all passionate coffee people, we probably want to be recognized for the quality and the, the service that, that we are giving. And, and so that needs to be defined and written down. Um, yeah, specialty coffee does not make you special, um, but it gives you a really great opportunity to do something um, tremendously outstanding. Um, do you want to be big or small? So this is the first Starbucks um, in Seattle from the 1970s, the little shop at the harbor. Um, beautiful, <laughs> actually. Uh, I think in the 70s they, they, they also had like fresh Kenyan arriving next week. D uh, please don't use milk. It's like black currant, uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, and then um, fast forward, uh, one of the biggest coffee companies uh, in the world, um, or do you want to be this guy in, Ky in Kyoto in a backyard? Um, again, beautiful, <laughs> three seats. Um, gave him my coffee. Uh, I'm not so sure if he enjoyed that. Actually, uh, <laughs> he was more used to kind of the local roast, um, overdosed, and so on, but in a very kind of specific way, and. Um, with a very personal service. So that is probably not very scalable um, as a concept. Um, and yeah, Starbucks, we all know. Global. Um, yeah. What is your long-term plan? Will you be employing staff? Do you want to have one location or more? Are you prepped to be busy? I think that's also a good question. When you build the bar and you lay out your workflow, the fridges you need for the milk, uh, where should people queue? Um, and when I started my little barn, um, it was meant to be like really open, espresso machine against the wall, um, turning around, serving kind of kitchen atmosphere, but then the hygiene office came and said like, no, 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 uh, line. Uh, protection, <laughs> wrap everything in plastic, ideally, and we'll know. Um, and um, coffee machine on an angle, so Barista started complaining, oh, my, my neck hurts, I need to turn my head. And I'm like, oh, but people can see your hands. Isn't it all about seeing how you're producing it and not hiding behind this block? 
um, and I had a butcher block where I like casually put my flat whites and and lattice and then that disappeared very quickly and I had to build a bar with a fridge and a pitcher rinser and so on so kind of like changing that while your business is running and getting bu busy is is really difficult so I think that needs to be um, considered at an at an early early stage um, location um, yeah so this is um, actually my neighborhood where I live and it's called uh, the barn quarter so finding the name was easy um, let's call it the barn uh, and um, and so I analyzed um, for like a few days um, the footfall and um, and also the community and the people and so uh, the north and south is uh, up there is uh, an area with a lot of residential people and then I have a um, kind of like shopping area here so people go um, that direction passing the shop and then I have some cultural things going on here with the synagogue and with like um, old um, uh, uh, heritage where people would come then in the afternoon and look at that so I have some tourism in that area um, I have a school across the street which is super handy in the morning actually in my first week I was uh, opening at 11 o'clock so I thought like oh, I go in in the morning I bake some cakes uh, and then you know I open and then I have a few customers <laughs> for lunch and then in the afternoon they come for coffee and the teachers and parents were knocking at my door at 8 of course they saw me in the <laughs> you know in the kitchen and so the second week I opened at 8 o'clock and needed to hire suddenly so um, that I didn't really um, planned so well, but work worked out really well. Um, I have a hospital right here um, with uh, patients and doctors. Um, the residentials are very creative and international, which helped me a lot, um, giving them something that they already knew from New York or Melbourne or wherever they uh, were coming from. Um, so um, the introduction of uh, a different taste and product wasn't um, so hard for part of it. Um, the harder part was really turning the Americans like to get away from like um, big Americanos with splash of cold milk and then lots of sugar. Um, but there is a Starbucks nearby so we had a way of redirecting them to where they were getting what they wanted. <laughs> so everybody was happy. Uh, <laughs> So um, a lot of shops and art galleries um, and public transport is not too far away. So like all of that, really like clicking, how many people are passing, um, what is the neighborhood looking like, what is the, like the flow and that could be expected. Um, and so that um, was the basis for like signing up the contract for long term. And I felt like if that would fail, I just put an office into it. So it like, I, um, I uh, started with a very, very small shop, which is still my favorite. Um, very cozy. Um, yeah, so, yeah, like I said, measure the footfall, uh, analyze what other coffee shops are on the street. Um, do you have s uh, exposure to sun? Do you have windows? Is it street level? Can you have seating outside? Is there any markets or parks around? Uh, and so on. Um, Check your neighbors. The worst thing is like to have a beautiful concept and then you need to close it because like some idiot is living upstairs and they don't want whatever the noise or the smell. Um, so that I think is um, I, th I think a, a, a risk that's always there, but it's always also good to talk to people in the neighborhood first. Um, yeah, do you need an office? Do you want to operate a kitchen? Then toilets and alcohol licensing. Um, how much is too much? I think that's always uh, tricky and it all depends on like what how much business do you expect and how much margin are you calculating on each latte or flat white or hand brew that you're handing out. So um, 1500 euros could be a lot but could be very very little really depending if you have 1500 euros in an area where no one is passing and it's like really really slow and you're not only busy on a Saturday it's maybe not such a great investment uh, and maybe 4,000 euros is not that much if you get really really busy and you have a fantastic location so I think that needs to be evaluated um, and, um, and and calculated um, do you expect seasonality 
um, like um, the little barn has is getting really slow in uh, winter times. Like last week was really no one on the street. Um, it's kind of a villagey neighborhood thing. And um, uh, it really um, is extremely busy in the summer when everybody comes and sits on the pavement and so on. So that factor, I think, should be should be planned in. Um, yeah, and then your staff cost, um, electricity, water, key deposit, and so on, which will all like end up in your in your business plan. Uh, yeah, this is. Um, just taking you uh, quickly through um, a base case uh, with not such high surplus in the end. Um, but I think as a rule of thumb, uh, I think we can say that uh, if you take your net turnover, your the cost of production of your coffee or food is probably around 30 to 35 percent. And the staff should include your own salary as owner. Um, but uh, what you're paying out uh, to the staff that you are uh, employing should probably be a healthy number is more towards 25 to 30. Um, but with this model, um, in down times, you would still survive. Um, the rent typically is around 10 to 15 percent. If you're lucky, you have 5 to 7.5 percent um, of your monthly turnover. And then the next number is a bit technical term is um, earnings before interest and depreciation, uh, depreciation and amortization. It's just like a bookkeeping term. Um, and then afterwards, uh, the things that are not related to operations, more to finance, and then also to replacement. So don't forget the depreciation. You need to replace uh, an espresso machine or a grinder or your bar needs renovation and that needs to be calculated in and put aside into the reserves. So the surplus is is, is, is very minimal. And um, to be honest with you, I've been working with that number for quite a long time. And the thing that drove me was really um, the job, <laughs> the community. Um, I had great coffee every day. Uh, and um, I was eating at the shop the leftovers. <laughs> Uh, painting a bleak picture, but uh, uh, very, very enjoyable. <laughs> um, but it takes some time to ramp up the business. So also like the ramping up time and building a community and make people come back. Every customer in the first two months that came back to us, we were like uh, kind of celebrating and they became friends. And um, that was a very intense period. And uh, I still remember, I don't know, Marta that walked through the door like an Italian professor for history, high heels, uh, big hair, and give me a ristretto and no acidity. <laughs> and I was like, well, uh, we have a Kenyan. <laughs> uh, try this. <laughs> it's really good. And um, I think, as always, as we see in fashion or many other areas, a lot of people don't have their their own taste. They just like what other people do that they like. And if it's within a range that's acceptable to them, they probably like that too. So Marta very quickly tweeted about the black currant she had in her espresso and never had before. And now she's part of that group who really understands the taste. And I think uh, it's important to bring people in that group without alienating them. And we need to lower the barriers, bring them all in, and um, uh, and adjust uh, to the level that the person has in front of us. I think a great hospitality person is a person that can read the customer that comes through the door. If it's just like once like a long black with a bit of milk, or once like a hand brew, and talk about. Um, natural processing in Brazil, you know. Um, sorry, I'm drifting. Um, some homework, um, yeah. We will go through some of that in the workshop, like setting up a business plan, um, market analysis, your branding, what do you want to be known for, how do you express that, um, a marketing plan, events, opening events, community events, um, a collaboration with other locals, uh, wine people, or craft beer, or, or chocolate, or anything that resonates with specialty. Um, building the team, uh, selecting the right people, 
uh, and then um, doing a, um, a milestone plan about the lead times for the build out and then um, planning the finance, um, the cost of building the business and then ramping it up. Yeah, uh, more, more of the same really. Um, need to decide what equipment you want, who's paying for that. Um, maybe your roaster will give you a nice option of lease, but then you're stuck with that roaster. Uh, do you want to be independent and buy your own and finance it? And you're a lot more free to, ch to choose who you want to work with. It's a big question, I think, especially in, in, in specialty, where we really want to find the product that suits us. Um, yeah, how much money do I really need? Um, is what does it cost to build a cafe? Is it 30,000 or 50,000 or 100,000? I think that number, to, 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 to know that number really helps um, by also then saying like, do I need a partner or investor? I often hear people say, oh, I'm starting a shop and I have an investor. And I was like, who is this? You know, uh, is it family and they leave you alone? Um, is it someone that understands the business is like a real partner and takes over some of the skill set that I need, like finance and accounting and so on? Or is it someone that is maybe in the way and the moment the shop really works well, I want to get rid of them. So maybe it's a, s a smart way of looking at this, like maybe I don't need an investor and I can go independent uh, and I do my own thing and find a bank that finances it and I'm pretty confident that it will work out because you know, I, like I'm ticking all the boxes and hopefully take a risk uh, and then run with that. Um, yeah, then architecture, the coffee menu, um, the bean supplier, food, no food, do I want takeaway? We had a long discussion in the beginning and didn't want to do takeaway coffee and we felt like, no, 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 everything from like ceramics or glass, not in a paper cup, it destroys the taste. But then we had so many um, creative people in the neighborhood and they didn't have the time and they just wanted a really good brew and then take it to the desk and then we, we felt like, okay, fuck it. Let's just give them, if they like it, give it to them and then in the end the taste is not so much worse. I think that was kind of pretty good uh, and uh, definitely better than like taking it from uh, whatever full automat uh, they have in the office. Um, Price setting, I think, is is very important. Um, you know, how much more can I charge for having a premium product, and is will that be acceptable to people? Uh, and sometimes, you know, ten cents more on a on a flat white or on an espresso would allow me to buy uh, a bean that's three euros more per kilo, um, and then I can buy a higher quality bean supplier and still be profitable. Um, for me, as a roaster, I hear that a lot for people saying like, ooh, I can only pay uh, so many euros per kilo, otherwise it uh, like wouldn't work out. And I think if you know who you are and if you have premium product, like 10 cent swing factor in your price settings for each drink would give you a lot more opportunities to, to buy maybe more freely without like being... Um, um Obliged by the by the by the prices, uh, and then competition, of course. What what is when I opened the little barn, I had um, the neighbor said like, "Oh, I have an espresso machine too. What are you doing here?" <laughs> I'm like, "I don't know. Um, my coffee will be different." Uh, <laughs> and um, and he said, "Oh, there are like eight espresso machines on the street. Um, you will not survive." <laughs> Um, and so I think like really kind of carving out and defining who you are and uh, what is your value proposition and your concept. Um, but then also like look at the neighborhood. Sometimes it could be very, very good to have Starbucks next door and just give people better coffee. They're already in the area for coffee. And um, you know, then the, a, a high proportion will probably come to you. Uh, so sometimes like building a neighborhood of like different joints and um, uh, different specialists is, is, a, is a good thing. We, for instance, we don't offer um, soy milk because we really don't like the taste so much. 
Um, but I understand the how people like soy milk. I also drink it sometimes um, when I'm like traveling or like, try get different taste experiences. Um, but I really strongly feel about being a specialist. And I think if someone wants to be a specialist for soy milk, or for uh, for vegan products, or for this and this and this, then that would be fantastic. I would love to have a coffee shop next to mine that has the best selection of soy milks. And then we can say like, oh, you go there, <laughs> your friend is coming to us, and then like the marketplace will be a lot more interesting. And um, I think the worst trap that one can fall into is like to try and please everyone. That, that will never be possible. Um, so yeah, these are the milestones. And I think we, we covered most of them. Um, yeah, and I think uh, we will do more in the breakout sessions. Um, thank you. Good luck. <laughs>
or it's your shop and uh, it should kind of like evolve but it should also be truthful to you and then as your crew is changing over with time they, you can't allow for everybody to change everything so to like establish um, a training culture or um, an open communication so people feel like they can say things and they will be considered is um, a big challenge if you have people working on bar all day and then how do you bring them together in the evening um, you know it's um, like especially and I can only talk for myself like having three operations um, to find leaders that like strong leadership shop managers and lead baristas that actually can manage their mates is kind of tricky Mm. Any, yeah. So did you have a high staff turnover or at the start or has got better or how did you overcome that issue you've kind of... Yeah, I think um, any cafe has like typically, and we had the discussion I think earlier today about um, Brighton, um, that number is probably like a normal number to say like six months, 12 months, and then we have people staying for two or three years. Um, definitely for me to um, s um, being in like be a roaster and have an office is giving people different um, opportunities to evolve within the company. They don't have to walk away and find that somewhere else. Um, but like retention um, is, I think, something that everybody works on. And it's easier if you're on bar yourself. So when I had my first shop, the retention was a lot better because everybody understands you. They talk to you directly and so on. And um, now you're more remote. Um, and then you need others to take over. And to find these people is uh, difficult. It's yeah, and especially in Berlin, I would add, um, where people, it's very tr tr transient. Um, and a lot of people come to Berlin to change their lifestyle and they fall back onto coffee because they know that best. And we have amazing people joining us, but then they also like change their vision for their own life. And then that's not so easy for an employer, yeah. I think we had a question from, yeah. I was kind of answered so already, but like, um, how long did it take you to actually let go of the first shot? Like, what was um, the toughest? Because, like, I have a lot of, like, control issues. So, kind of, like, the idea of uh, passing over to someone else and trusting someone else is really terrifying for me. So, like, did you, or how did you experience that? Um, yeah, uh, it's probably like a mother letting go <laughs> and not like helicoptering. Um, it's it's not easy. I mean, um, you need to have strong systems in place. Like from the beginning, that's what I learned. You need to set up even a small shop with two or three people as if it was large. So you need to have opening, closing lists, your serving standards, take pictures of how you want stuff have like... Uh, served or the setup of the chairs and everything. So like people need guidance and they want to come in and do their job. And if it's confusing and if they don't really know what to do, uh, we at a very early stage created a barista Bible with all the serving standards so we can relate to that. And um, yeah, I think that's probably the, the, the only way like standard answers, um, the philosophy, um, have a training period when people come into the company to really um, share your vision with them. Um, and But then it's also up to them to express that to the customers. They're all individuals and they have different ways. We have really shy people, and but they are great at the customer. But they also need to communicate with them and talk about coffee. Um, and then we have like very outspoken acting style um, performers and they are great too but that could also be annoying for some customers so I mean um, we allow like a range of course of people and expressing themselves and then yeah 
you just need to like let it flow. I think also my perception of your your talk and what you're trying to get at as well is is kind of like if you know that about yourself and you know that what would make you most happy is to run your own shop and not to have anyone else there then it's about building the plan that allows you to have that and and it not be just like a pain or not be something you're or something you're going to enjoy Anyway, um, we will have lots more opportunities to talk to Ralph this afternoon. So uh, if we could give him one more round of applause.